This is Dr. J. Welcome to Thesis in 101, where you reference everything, including the tree your thesis is printed on. In this series, we cover tips and tricks to help you in your research journey. If you're interested and you would like to see more videos like this, please give this a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Today's focus is on the assumptions of your chosen philosophical stance. Let's get right into it. In the previous tutorial, we looked at an overview of the six elements that typically make up a research design, and we spent quite a bit of time understanding the purpose of research philosophies. In today's lesson, we continue the path of philosophies, focusing on the set of assumptions they come with. As a reminder, when we conduct research, we aim to solve a real-life problem, and it is the problem that dictates which philosophical stance or research paradigm we need to adopt. The better you find the problem, the easier it is to identify the paradigm. I've listed a few on the screen. Each philosophical stance or paradigm comes with its own set of assumptions or delimitations. These assumptions focus on your views as the researcher on reality or knowledge. Today we are going to focus on each assumption and what it means in the research process. In the interest of time, I will only be focusing on one research paradigm and its related assumptions or delimitations to demonstrate how these assumptions impact your behavior and decision making as a researcher. Let's use interpretivism. There are five assumptions or delimitations we need to be aware of. First, ontology. Ontology refers to what reality is and what can be known about reality. If you watched my previous tutorial, you would know that the interpretivist researcher believes that reality is socially constructed. For instance, money can be valuable to one person, but worthless to the next. It is very important that you understand the ontological assumptions of a research paradigm before you move on to any of the other assumptions. So once again, here is a recap of the ontology of interpretivism. Reality is subjective as understood by the individual. Multiple realities are equally valid. The world is multi-layered. Multiple realities can only be imperfectly understood, and the researcher influences the participant and vice versa. The next assumption that we will be looking at is epistemology. Epistemology is concerned with what knowledge is and how it is acquired. It also focuses on the relationship between the person in the know, who is the participant, and the person who would like to know, who is the researcher. In practical terms, epistemology is guiding you as a researcher in the following aspects. What is it that you want to know? Who can tell you what you want to know, whether it is a person or object such as a plant or animal or virus? And how are they, person or object, going to tell you what you want to know? So let's look at the epistemological assumptions as it relates to interpretivism. The interpretivist researcher must interact with the participants in the study in order to gain the desired knowledge. This interaction or engagement is not only focused on what meaning an individual attached to a particular phenomenon, but also focused on how the individual arrives at that meaning. In other words, we want to know the details of a situation, the details behind the details of the situation, and the motivating actions of why the details are there in the first place. You know, the basic foundations of gossiping. So what impact does the epistemological assumption of interpretivism have on the research process? While it may mean that instead of an anonymous questionnaire as a research instrument, we may want to use an interview, because that would promote engagement with our participants more. Since we would like to understand why the participant feels a certain way about something, we may opt to use a semi-structured interview so we can customize the interview as we go. The type of questions we ask in the first place would be focused on understanding the participant's reality. Something else that may promote engagement with the participant may be meeting them where they feel most at home so we may decide to have these interviews on site. By no means am I saying if you are doing an interpretive study, you should always use a semi-structured interview and do it on the participant's home turf. What I am saying is that the data collection and analysis techniques we choose is governed by the research problem we would like to solve, which in turn dictates the philosophical stance we need to adopt. Each philosophical stance comes with assumptions, and these assumptions sort of nudge us to the data collection and analysis techniques that are most appropriate. The next assumption that we will be looking at is axiology. Axiology refers to the role the researcher's own values play in acquiring knowledge in the research process. Every decision we make from the topic we choose to the research instrument we use to how we interpret our data demonstrates the values we hold dear as a researcher. Think about the topic you've chosen or the topic you would like to choose. Every chosen topic tells the world that you value this topic above all the other topics that are available. If you decide to do an interview over an anonymous survey, you tell the world that the most important thing to you is engagement with your participants. The point of axiology, which is your values, biases, or judgments, is for you to think about the role values play in your study, and how these values may impact the results of your research. Each philosophical stance comes with its own axiological assumptions. 
So let's look at the axiological assumptions native to interpretivism. To the interpretivist researcher, reality is socially constructed, subjective. Because of this, the researcher is required to interact with their participants in order to uncover the knowledge that they seek. Due to the nature of interpretivism, it would be very unfair if all of a sudden we tell our interpretivist researcher who is actively looking for subjective data to check their values and be totally objective. I mean, that is just setting someone up for failure. Therefore, the axiological assumptions for interpretivism is that the researcher's values cannot be divorced from the researcher itself. In other words, it is perfectly okay for the interpretivist researcher to have their biases present when they conduct the study. But what does that mean in practice? I mean, if I can take my biases with me wherever I go, doesn't that mean I'm just going to find what I want to find and make the data say what I would like it to say, even if contradictory data is staring me right in the face? Not quite. Irrespective of the philosophical stance you take, you must still apply scientific rigor when conducting research. In the case of the interpretivist researcher, you need to 1. Declare and describe your biases. This is because the people reading your work would like to understand your socially constructed reality and how you got there. By doing this, you are heightening your spidey senses to recognize and address your biases throughout the research process. And you are also acknowledging that anyone with a different set of values may come to a different conclusion even if they are looking at the same set of data. 2. You need to create strict protocols for data collection and data analysis. To assist you with this, you may want to use a theoretical or conceptual framework so that you know what knowledge to look for. You may want to pair this with a codebook so you can recognize the knowledge when you observe it. And of course, an actual research protocol that is a detailed account of your research techniques and processes so that you can systematically collect and analyze data and leave a blueprint for any other researcher who may want to replicate your study. For good measure, if your problem requires it, you may want to use both qualitative and quantitative data collection and analysis techniques to triangulate your findings, which translates to perhaps doing qualitative interviews and doing quantitative questionnaires, essentially collecting both subjective and more objective data. All of these are, of course, customizable depending on the research problem you would like to solve. Let's take a break from the ologies and focus on rhetoric structure. Rhetoric structure describes how we write about knowledge as in how the information uncovered in the study is presented to the intended audience. It speaks to language use, graphs, models, you know, anything that shows up on the paper for the reader to digest. Rhetoric structure is closely related to axiology and epistemology. So let's take a look at what that means for our interpretivist researcher. By now you should know that from an epistemological perspective, the interpretivist researcher need to interact with their participant. We need to find out how they arrive at the meaning, so we need to look at more than just words. You know, what they say and how they say it. Body language plays a role here. You also know that the researcher is not expected to divorce themselves from their values, so the researcher's biases will be present in the study. This means that the language the researcher uses will be indicative of their biases. So how does knowing this influence how we conduct research? Well, it influences it quite a bit. Let's start with data instruments. If you are conducting an interview, you need to create non-leading questions, as in avoid cleverly asking the questions in such a way that the participant has no choice but to tell you what you want to hear to support your biases. You also may want to add direct quotes from your participants so that the reader can assess if the conclusions you draw are valid. What we put on paper also includes the use of models and graphs to explain ideas and support your findings. For instance, you are giving feedback on the conditions of trucks in a shipping company. Statement 1. A third of the company's trucks are out of order. Statement 2. There are three trucks and one is out of order. While technically both is saying the same thing, the way it is represented creates two completely different stories. Overall, the rhetoric structure is all about how you tell your story. The last of the assumptions is methodology. Methodology is all about how we study knowledge. It is concerned with the processes and procedures the researcher follows throughout their study. The most basic choice to consider is qualitative versus quantitative. Less basic, of course, is our research instrument. Are we going to use questionnaires, experiments, interviews? You know, the practices of data collection and data analysis. I find that a lot of new researchers jump straight from problem to methodology without considering the impact of the other assumptions or the quality of their research. The consequences of not thinking about these things often leads to a disjointed research design that may lead to collecting data that cannot answer your research question. So what would our methodology look like for an interpretivist study? You may have noticed that with each assumption we looked at, we thought about the impact it would have on our methodology. From an ontological perspective, we said that reality is socially constructed by individuals, therefore we have to collect data from, well, people. 
From an epistemological perspective, we said that the participant have knowledge and we are going to uncover this knowledge by interacting with them, and we decided on a semi-structured interview. From an axiological perspective, we said that we got some biases and we need to create strict protocols to show scientific rigor. Part of this demonstration of scientific rigor was to do a mixed method study focusing on both qualitative and quantitative data. And we decided that in addition to doing an interview, we would also do a questionnaire. When we described our rhetoric structure, we decided that we need to include direct quotes and graphs and models. In order to be able to do this, we would need to do both qualitative and quantitative data analysis. Our techniques may include thematic analysis for qualitative and statistical analysis for quantitative. As you can see, the philosophical stance and its associated assumptions guides us in terms of how we should go about solving our research problem. That's all for me today. If you have a question, please add it to the comment section. Like this, share this, subscribe to this. This is Dr. J signing off.